Hello everyone. Thank you so much for checking out this presentation titled Where Are the Black Designers? This is an update to a 2015 presentation, also titled Where Are the Black Designers, which I first gave at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. This updated presentation was given in November 2020 at the AIGA Design Conference. To follow along with the conversation or to help boost the ideas from this presentation, please use the hashtag WATBD2020, or you can use the hashtag AIGA Design Conf. So let's get started. My name is Maurice Cherry. I'm from Selma, Alabama. And in 1996, I discovered the internet and HTML. Even though the internet, HTML, and even the World Wide Web were in their beginning stages, I fell in love with the possibility of designing and creating whatever you wanted. However, if you were around in 1996 and you remember what the web looked like, well, it was not great. I mean, this was Apple's website. And this was McDonald's website. This was Coca-Cola's website. Look at that navigation at the top. And at the bottom of the page, there's a gavel and a shoe shaper and pennies. I, I have no idea what that means. This was Pepsi's website. Check out all the lovely relics on this page. Real Audio, Shockwave, Microsoft Internet Explorer. Oh, and a low resolution version of the website at 28.8 baud's per second. But even with the web looking as basic as it did, uh, the potential to publish and create whatever you wanted was really exciting. So in 1999, I graduated from high school. I moved from Selma to Atlanta to attend Morehouse College, a well-known all-male historically black college. For those of you who might not be familiar with Morehouse, some of its famous alumni include the actor Samuel L. Jackson, uh, prolific filmmaker Spike Lee, as well as Martin Luther King Jr. So yeah, I got to Morehouse and I wanted to major in computer science because I loved the internet and HTML and making web pages. And you have to keep in mind, this was near the late 90s, so there was lot, not a lot of information out there about how to make websites. I thought that going into computer science would be the next logical step for me. But also, I wanted to be like this guy. For those who might not know, this is Dwayne Wayne. He's one of the protagonists of a sitcom on NBC that aired in the 90s called A Different World, which was about college students at the fictional HBCU Hillman College. Fun fact, Hillman College was inspired in part by Morehouse College. Anyway, Dwayne majored in math and engineering. He became a math teacher later in the show, and he even created a video game. I mean, as far as early role models for the STEM fields, Dwayne Wayne was it. So one day I talked to my computer programming teacher, who was also my advisor, about how I was interested in HTML and making websites. And well, he kind of gave me this look. He looked at me like I was crazy. The internet? Building websites? He told me that the internet was just a fad, that we don't do that here. If that's something that you want to do, then you should probably change your major. So I did. I changed my major to math. I graduated from Morehouse College with honors in 2003. And after that, I had the opportunity to hone my skills as a designer for five years in Atlanta with these companies. In 2008, I quit my job and I started my own design studio, Lunch. And I used what I learned about design to create solutions for nonprofit organizations, politicians, and small businesses. Also, while running lunch, I taught design and other subjects at the following places. I started a few projects that you may have heard of. I'll talk about Revision Path, 28 Days of the Web, and to Recognize a bit later. And my work has been mentioned and featured in some of the following places. So that's me, and this is Where Are the Black Designers? Now, if you didn't see my 2015 presentation, I would highly suggest checking that out. You can search for it on YouTube. Uh, if you're on the AIGA website, you can find it there as well. This update is not a rehash of that presentation, rather. It's an addendum, an update, if you will. Like I said before, it's an update. Because the reality is that the design community has changed quite a bit since 2015. There's actually more places to find black designers than ever before, and I say that with zero hyperbole. I also say that because many black designers have seen this question and I left comments and sent me tweets and emails saying, where are the black designers? Well, duh, I'm right here. We're right here. Why would you even ask that stupid question? I know, it's, it's a rhetorical question. But unfortunately, the reality is that it's still a question that needs to be asked and answered, even with the changes and shifts in the industry over the past five years. 
So if you're a black designer out there and this question irks you, if it causes you to bristle a bit, good. Keep that same energy and use that to fuel and maintain your visibility as a black designer. We see you and more importantly, we need to see you. Truth be told, I still get this question very regularly, and I produce a weekly podcast that interviews black designers. So really the question of where are the black designers is not for you, lone black designer who may be viewing this presentation. This is a question with a complicated answer. Speaking of which, there's a good chance you've seen or heard of this statistic in the past couple of years. 3% of designers across all industries are black. This data comes from AIGA's design census, which was started by Antoinette Carroll in 2014, who was on AIGA's Diversity and Inclusion Task Force as co-chair at the time, and the goal of this was to create an up-to-date overview of the design industry. AIGA began distributing the survey in 2016, released it again in 2017, and after a pause in 2018, picked the survey up back again for 2019, as you see here. This 3% statistic that I talked about earlier was a constant finding from each year's results. For each iteration of the design census, AIGA worked on expanding access to the survey. Currently, the survey respondents are made up of AIGA members, AIGA social media followers, AIGA Ion design readers, AIGA design conference attendees. You may be sensing a pattern here. In other words, that 3% statistic, unfortunately, is not indicative of designers across all industries. It's really more like 3% of designers who are in the AIGA ecosystem. Now, this is something that has also been acknowledged by AIGA, who said of the 2019 design census that next year, that being 2020, we hope to extend the design census to the rest of the world. Now, AIGA is not the first organization to undertake this kind of research. A List Apart, an online platform for designers, developers, and content specialists, created the Survey for People Who Make Websites in 2007, and they conducted the survey every year until 2011. Back in 2015, when I talked with Sarah Wachter Betcher, the former editor in chief of A List Apart, she told me about the difficulties with the survey, one of the main ones being that not only was there no data out there about web designers and developers, but apparently no one had even asked the questions. So they produced their own questions, they distributed the survey, they parsed the results each year, and they built upon that with each new survey to get a better view of the industry. One interesting observation, according to Sarah, was that the survey results ended up just reflecting their own audience, which was made up of a list apart readers and an events apart attendees. An events apart is a series of conferences for web professionals that a list apart puts on every year. Now this should sound familiar to you. Jeffrey Zeldman, designer, writer, and publisher of A List Apart, said this about the surveys as well in, in an article on his website. By 2012, perhaps because so few data points seemed to change from year to year, the community that had participated so vigorously during the first five years of surveys began to fade. Faced with mounting resource challenges and the indifference of the design, tech, and mainstream press, we have put the surveys on hold for now. Now, I'm mentioning both the AIGA Design Census and a List Apart survey to say this. Finding accurate data about the number of and types of designers in this industry continues to pose a challenge. The data from these surveys applies to their respective design organizations' members, but unfortunately ends up being applied incorrectly, usually by the media, to the entire design industry. So while the numbers around how many black designers are in the industry is still a little iffy, the reality is that the visibility of black designers as reflected through design media, events, publications, and the like is still pretty bad. I mean, why else would the title of this presentation still be relevant five years later, am I right? But you know, let's move past surveys. Honestly, I could give a whole presentation on making great surveys. I do have a degree in math, but that's not why you're here. But Maurice, how about some of the top art and design schools? Surely there are black designers there. And you know, five years ago in my presentation, I looked at some of the top art and design schools that agencies and tech startups and other companies recruit from all the time. It wasn't an exhaustive list. So you may not see some popular schools on here, but these were the percentages of black students that were enrolled in schools in 2015, 
We've got Rhode Island School of Design, Pratt Institute, School of Visual Arts, Parsons, the New School for Design, Maryland Institute College of Art, or MICA, and the Savannah College of Art and Design, or SCAD. Here are the percentages at those same schools five years later. Now, there are slight increases overall. Uh, RISD, Parsons, and SCAD all went up a percentage point. MICA went up two percentage points, but still, it's not great. And while these schools may have a lot of talented designers, finding black designers there is still going to be a challenge. This is especially true if you look at how much these schools cost. Now, here are the tuition costs for the 2015 through 2016 school year from the schools that I mentioned before. And here they are now in 2020. Interestingly, there's an average 12% decrease in tuition. This could be because of tuition discounts, because of the coronavirus, or any number of reasons. But the tuition doesn't consider other fees that go into art and design school, like room and board, department costs, equipment, etc. I know from designers that I've talked with for Revision Path that design school can be very expensive and the costs add up quickly. Also, sadly, the economic disparity with black families makes paying for these schools very difficult, even with financial aid. Look at these two charts from the Pew Research Center. The median household income for blacks and Hispanics in 2014 dollars is $43,300. Compare that with Asians and whites where income is nearly two times greater. And net worth? $11,200 for blacks in 2014 dollars and nearly 13 times that for whites at $144,200. Now imagine trying to attend one of the schools shown earlier with family income that low. It's not impossible, but it's certainly not an easy option. Oh, oh, but Maurice, what about HBCUs? I mean, you went to an HBCU. I did. Um, I didn't go with getting a design degree in mind, but companies are starting to look to HBCUs to find black designers, which makes sense. Now, while I don't have a lot of data around HBCUs as compared to other four-year institutions, on average, the cost for tuition to HBCUs tends to be substantially lower than four-year institutions for private or public colleges. Matter of fact, try searching HBCU tuition costs in the search engine, and you'll see the word affordable pop up a lot. Remember those income and net worth graphs that we just saw? So let's put all of this together, right? HBCUs have lower overall tuition costs. Couple that with the data we saw earlier from Pew Research Center around net worth and household income, and we can deduce that HBCUs from a strictly financial standpoint are what black families can reasonably afford when it comes to college without much strain. But let's dig a bit deeper and ask some questions. Are the curricula between HBCU and the top art and design schools comparable? Is there a design program at, let's say, Howard University of the same quality and value and rigor as one at, say, MICA or RISD? What about career prospects or alumni networks? Are companies recruiting from HBCUs in the same way and with the same frequency as they are from these top art and design schools? And does an art or design degree from an HBCU get the same amount of consideration as one from a top art or design school? I'm just gonna leave you to think about what the answers to those questions might be. Now let's look at how AIGA has tried to help bring a more diverse range of designers into the industry. 29 years ago, AIGA published a journal article called Why is Graphic Design 93% White? Removing Barriers to Increase Opportunities in Design. This was written by historian Brenda Mitchell Powell. You can find a PDF of this journal article on the AIGA website, by the way. I highly suggest you check it out and read it. It's quite good and sadly, still very relevant. From this article, a survey was created, AIGA loves their surveys, and directed to 350 design firms, 235 design schools, and over 500 multicultural designers. The data from this survey was presented at a working conference at the High School of Art and Design in New York on April 5th, 1991, and it pointed out several different concerns regarding minority representation in the graphic design industry. Access to resources, old boys networks, lack of role models, etc. Solutions were provided to fix these issues. 
Chief among them were the establishment of a mentor program, a job bank or internship program, and access to educational opportunities. Now, AIGA provides much of this already through chapters and through their headquarters. But the problems around diversity in the design industry, as heady as they are, they all got together, they solved them during that symposium, and we all lived happily ever after. Of course, that didn't happen because here I am, and here you are, and we're discussing this. So Maurice, where do I find black designers? You know, let's look at a long but non-exhaustive list of places to find black designers, shall we? Of course, I'm going to shout out my babies first and foremost. Revision Path at the top here is a weekly podcast where I interview black designers, developers, and digital creatives from all over the world. I've done this since 2013, and as of this video, I've done over 375 interviews, and it's the first podcast in the Smithsonian for the National Museum of African American History and Culture. 28 Days of the Web, which you see here in the middle, that's Revision Path's sister site, and that's where I spotlight a different black designer or developer for every day in February in celebration of and in conjunction with Black History Month. Now, I've done 28 Days of the Web since 2014, and you've probably seen some very similar sites crop up from others in the years since then that resemble this. Recognize is my newest project, a design anthology featuring essays and commentary from indigenous people and people of color, the next generation of emerging design voices. Volumes one and two, collectively Space and Fresh, are both available to read now at recognize.design. As of this recording, we will be coming out with volume three uh, later in 2021. Next, of course, there's HBCUs, which I mentioned earlier. And you know, I know I already talked about this, but if you're only looking at them as a resource that you can take from, then I want to suggest that you stop the pipeline. I'm not even a fan of that word pipeline in this context, as pipelines tend to strip resources away from one location and transport them somewhere else. Instead, look at how you can forge relationships with HBCUs for mutual gains. Talk to department heads, talk to educators there, and ask about how your company can help with resources, whether that's having employees as instructors, whether it's giving suggestions on curriculum, or even opening up a mentorship or an internship program. Because here's the thing, uh, corporate banking, engineering, Many other industries are already doing this with HBCUs, and it's paying huge dividends for both them and the schools. So what's stopping you from picking up the phone and making it happen for your company? Now, social media is a fantastic way to connect with people, and that's not just because we are in the middle of a global health pandemic. <laughs> I'll list a few groups and such based on some of the more popular social media sites. And there's probably going to be some overlap here. Some of these organizations and groups are on multiple platforms. So connect where you feel the most comfortable. Now, I'm not on Facebook anymore, personally. But when I was on Facebook, these were some of the groups I frequented. Lots of great information, lots of fellowship in these groups. Some of these groups are public and some are private, so be aware of that. Instagram, although it is a visual medium, provides an easy way to discover talent just by searching some hashtags. Here's a few hashtags you can use, as well as some accounts that you can follow. Now, I find most of the people that I interview for Revision Path on LinkedIn, surprisingly. It's a tremendous resource for discovering black designers. Probably didn't think about LinkedIn. It's actually really good. Here's a few groups that you can check out. Twitter, hellscape that it is sometimes, can be another fantastic place to find black designers. I mean, I've seen some great conversations there, some great threads. You should definitely look at Twitter. Now, some of these Twitter accounts that are listed here are for groups or organizations, but they are run by individuals. So make sure that you're approaching them respectfully. There's also quite a few directories out there, including mainstays like Behance and Dribbble, and newer ones like Diverse Creatives. Check these out for places to find black designers as well. You know, one benefit of 2020 has been the number of new design events that have been created that are online. Wonderful virtual events. Some in-person events have also gone completely virtual, like Afrotech and Hue Design Summit. And then there's new ones like the State of Black Design and Where Are the Black Designers? 
which borrows its title from my presentation, that are great to check out for fellowship, for finding new people, finding opportunities. Highly, highly recommend checking these out. There's also a lot of other design podcasts out there that are either talking specifically with black designers or are hosted by black designers. Revision Path is no longer the only game in town. I'm glad to say that. <laughs> so subscribe to any of these today in the podcatcher of your choice. There's also a few vibrant Slack communities out there you can join if you're into Slack. Some of these are invite only, so search Google or Twitter to find invites. As you can see, there really is no shortage of where to find black designers if you just look for them. You know, back in 2015, I asked this question about how do we fix the lack of black designers present in the industry? And honestly, I feel this is the wrong question to ask as it relates to this current topic. Because as you just saw, we're out here everywhere. Even at the AIGA design conference where I presented this, even at South by Southwest where I gave the first one in 2015, they could even be among your local AIGA chapter. We're here. I think the better question is, why aren't you using your resources to ensure black designers achieve equity? And with this question, I'm not just talking about mentorship or internships or apprenticeships or things like that. Those are great. You've seen the data as I've presented it here. So how are you actively using your privilege, your power, your money and your connections to help correct decades of deep seated inequity in this industry? Because guess what? I'm not giving an update to this presentation in 2025. This is it, okay? Many of you have already shown us earlier in 2020 that you're committed to helping uplift black voices and black people after the death of George Floyd, right? Black Lives Matter, right? I mean, that's what you posted those black squares on Instagram and Twitter for, right? Now, I'm being slightly facetious here, but the truth is that I want to be able to look at the industry that I've been fortunate to have a successful career in and see a reflection of the real world. Different people, different cultures, and people with different life experiences all coming together to create solutions for an ever-changing society. Hopefully, this presentation gave you some food for thought, as well as tons of resources to check out. I'm pretty sure I left someone out, left something out. Please charge that to my head, not my heart. If anything, it is a testament to the fact that there are so many resources out there that I couldn't even think of them all. Thank you for listening to this presentation.